Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you once again uh, for joining us um, at uh, NB Heart Center CV uh, Weekly Rounds. Um, I'd like to uh, take just a, a quick second to reintroduce uh, Dr. Yaroslav Hubachek, one of our interventional cardiologists who joined us back in, I believe it was 2010 or thereabouts, um, and uh, has, has obviously been one of our uh, really one of our excellent interventional cardiologists and really putting, pushing the edge as it relates to uh, CTO and, and various other sort of surgical, uh, sorry, interventional advances. Um, and he was kind enough to offer up a three-part series, uh, the first of which we've already kind of gotten into, which was um, diagnostic modalities in the cath lab, um, looking at things like IFR, FFR, RFR, uh, IVIS, et cetera. And then the second in this three-part series looks at calcified lesions in the cath lab, uh, the role of the rotoblader and IVL. And I thought once again, as uh, not only as surgeons, but also just as cardiologists and cardiac uh, practitioners as a whole, I thought it would be really neat to understand better what it is that goes on in the cath lab as it relates to some of these very challenging lesions that aren't amenable to sort of straightforward PCI. So without further ado, I'd, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Hibachek and uh, thank you once again for doing this. Good morning, everybody. Since we have short time, let's start. Uh, we'll start talking about the calcium, if I can my computer work. So coronary calcium is nothing new and it was described in 1799 in a patients with uh, angina and syncope anginosa. So, nothing that we haven't seen before. Uh, and it represents significant challenges uh, from surgical and percutaneous perspective. Uh, when we look at the percutaneous perspective, if vessels are very calcified and tight lesions, we can't uh, cross the lesion with the regular balloon. So we have uh, difficulty crossing or expanding the lesion. You see the so-called dog boning on a balloon, so the lesion did not expand it. Uh, the elimination of the stent uh, occurs, stents are underexpanded, I mean there's residual significant stenosis, there are perforations and subsequent uh, tamponades that can occur and uh, <clears throat> causing the wire bias in a vessels, i.e. on one side of the vessel. Uh, so multiple challenges that we have difficulty to managing. So it's not only our comfort level and the easiness of working about these calcium lesions, but as the calcium severity increases from mild to severe, and the outcome as well getting uh, worse, as you can see here, especially with a maze, uh, from mortality from a my and total uh, revascularization perspective. So how can we identify calcium? Uh, inter a radiologist can find it on a CT and there is something called calcium score that predicts the outcome. We can do it on a cardiac catheterization, which you can see this black line and you see essentially outline of, in this case, RCA, even without injecting the contrast, suggestive of significant calcification. We can use the IVAS that shows the white rim with the acoustic shadows. We already touched it on the last presentation. And then an OCT, uh, which looks like a pocket of something that you could delineate it with the pencil and it's like a nice delineation of the calcium. Perfect, we have a calcium, what are we gonna do, uh, do with it? And really it depends how much calcium is any particular lesion. Therefore we have to understand it better. How we can understand it, all the techniques that we just described, each has its positive and uh, negative <coughs> components and there is no perfect test. Therefore, utilization of many techniques is important to appropriately use it for any particular patient. These are the uh, currently available techniques uh, that we have to deal with the calcium. We do not have orbital arterectomy or laser, so we won't talk about it uh, today. In the old days, we use a non-compliant balloon and trying to go higher pressure, bigger balloon, and lead to dis uh, dissections and perforations. Subsequently, we had a cutting balloon, which is essentially a surgical blade mounted onto the balloon, but then uh, trying to crack the calcium. Uh, this was quite dangerous, and many cases describe of the blade staying behind. Uh, therefore, we came with the angioscalp, which is essentially the wire mounted on the balloon. And uh, new slash old technology, rotational arterectomy, intravascular lithotripsy as the newest technique uh, that we have available uh, with us. 
before we start talking about particular techniques, it's important to understand that uh, this is not black and white, yes, no presence. And you have in one vessel, you can have a lesions that are going from lipidic uh, lesions on the left side to all the way to the severe calci severely calcified lesion. And therefore, uh, you cannot use same approach for all the vessels and as the bottom you see you're going from direct standing for very lipidic lesions to going the compliant non-compliant balloonous uh, thickness stiffness and calcium presence increasing within the lesion all the way to rotational arterectomy or arterectomy in general and intravascular leukotripsy or IVL. So how we decide which lesion is bad enough to use uh, the more aggressive therapies we discussed this last time, uh, calcium on the IVAS is seen as the wide ring. It's significant calcium if it's more than 270 degrees, or so-called napkin ring is more than 360. Or we can use OCT, which we can delineate the calcium better and get more features of the calcium outside of the ring. We can measure the thickness because the red light goes past the calcium and we can delineate it. And then the length uh, of the uh, calcium. If you assign the points for each particular uh, factor, you come up with the so-called OCT calcium score. What does it mean in the practice? I have three examples. First, in an A row, there is the concentric calcium of 360 degrees, but it's very thin, about point, less than 0.5 millimeters, and very short, and with regular balloon let, the expansion of the stent to 99%. Desired is more than 90 so we achieve good angiographic result and therefore most likely a reasonable long-term outcome. If you look at case number two in a bureau, which is quite heavy calcified nodule, which is very thick, about 1.1 millimeters, but again, it's short and a very small angle, about only 75 degrees. Therefore, OCT score was one and they achieved with the angioplasty 97% expansion. Uh, again, very good result. On a C, uh, is the calcified, very calcified uh, lesion with uh, thick calcium of 1.4 millimeters and it was length of 11 uh, millimeters, therefore score, OCT score was four. In this case, as you can see, based on the lumen, there is significant under expansion of the stand with small cross-sectional area of the stand and the expansion percentage was only 68%, so very unsatisfactory result. So how can we prevent happen, uh, this uh, under expansion uh, uh, occurring in this severely calcified lesion? Again, get back to our modalities. So if it's not very severe, we can start with the balloons, uh, angioscalp, and if it gets worse, we start with rotational arterectomy, intravascular lithotripsy. Well, so let's start to talk about uh, rotational arterectomy first. As you can see, it's a brand new technique that's been in use since uh, 1988 and has two peaks in a, this one is the number of publications that occur. So first peak of the use was uh, at the end of 1990s. And again, after 2010, the interest in rotational arterectomy increased. Uh, I will get to why this happened. If you look at the percentage of uh, rotational arterectomies from all the angioplasties, these are data from the Europe, uh, vary quite significantly from about 3% in the uh, United Kingdom to 0.8% in Germany. Just to give you the perspective how we doing, we introduced it in 2019 and we use it on average 1.6% per year. So we are like in the middle of the pack of the usage. So why did we start to use it in 2018 and why the world started to use it again after 2010? Uh, one of the major trials that contributed them was uh, prepare calc trial uh, that demonstrated that from all the calcified lesions, if you do just balloon, angioscalbo cutting balloons, you will have more than 20% uh, residual stenosis in 2% of the patients. Four percent of patients will have failed stand means that the results will be suboptimal and 16 percent of the patients you will have to cross over to another modality to modify calcium i.e in this particular case the rotational arterectomy so on average you have 20 percent of the calcified lesions will not be able to treat with the 
uh, regular balloon angioplasty and we need to cross over to rotational arthrectomy. For the skeptics, 80% of calcified lesion can be successfully treated with balloons. So not every calcified lesion requires rotational arthrectomy or IVL as of today. Uh, other reason why rotational arthrectomy got the second, second wind was that the rate of complication was not significantly different. Numerically higher, as you can see from perforation to effusion to no slow, on average about five to seven percent. Therefore, it was way lower than previously. The most important part for me was that they change how the rotational arthrectomy looks like. The top picture showed the old, very complex things that they couldn't figure out. Therefore, when they come with the new one, nicer one, I like it, we start to use it. Okay, real reasons. Uh, over the years, we find out that uh, rotational arthrectomy originally was used uh, using the wire to cross the lesion. With development of the microcatheters, we can use workhorse wires to cross the complex lesions and then exchange for rotational arthrectomy wire, which is required to put the burr on it. Uh, because the diameter of the rotational arthrectomy wire is 0.009 compared to 0.014 for the regular workhorse wire. We changed the approach. It went from debulking, means the reducing amount of the tissue within the lesion, which we use 0.7 burr to vessel ratio. The smaller burrs about 0.4 to 0.5. And the goal is to minimize the debris and debulking and rather focusing on breaking the calcium rather than debulking it. Other significant contribution to improve the outcome and reducing the risk was changing the speed of the burr. Originally, it was 180 to 200,000 RPMs, which subsequently <clears throat> was decreased to 135 to 180, which we're using currently. So with uh, prepare calc trial and changes in how we're using rotational arthrectomy, we significantly we make it significantly safer. So what is the burr? Burr is uh, elliptical sphere, which has diamonds on it. The best description for the patient, it is a uh, diamond bullet. Both female and male patients like it because girls like the diamonds and boys like the bullets. What it's creating, it's creating small little particles. They are five microns in size, which is smaller than the red cells. Therefore, they pass through the heart and subsequently being excreted from the body. This is the scheme, schematic demonstration, how it works, focusing on debulking, but there are multiple cracks in a calcium that occur. If you look inside of the vessel after rotational arthrectomy, you have something successful rotational arthrectomy leads to something called uh, uh, rubber duck sign. As the best seen in a C component, you see the body and the head and it's called rubber duck, means that the berg went through it and causing few fractures, such as successful procedure. One example, this was the STEMI patient that came uh, directly uh, to the cath lab after uh, thrombolytics. He was smoker, 63 years old. This is, you can see, severely calcified vessel. Before contrast goes in, you see whole vessel. And mid-RCA had uh, significant calcified lesion. And we tried to cross the lesion uh, with the, our smallest balloon. And as you can see, we didn't even get close to the lesion despite using uh, aggressive guide and extension catheter balloon did not even get to the lesion. Procedure was abandoned, uh, stopped, and we brought patient back later after discussing, uh, discussing rotational arthrectomy. Uh, we changed the approach, we went femoral for better support. We used different guide, uh, extension catheter, and you can see now balloon is already across the lesion, but was unable to dilate the lesion. Therefore, we proceed with rotational arthrectomy, which you see here, burr in a pecking-like motion, engaging the calcium and eventually crossing that calcified lesion. The rapidly uh, spinning burr in a coronary artery is not the safest way how to deal with it. And you see what the consequence of that rotational arthrectomy was, which is heavily dissected RCA throughout the course. Uh, however, we were able to salvage the vessel and get good results following stenting, which then it was no problem delivering the stents 
uh, secure the vessel. So let's move on IVL, intravascular lithotripsy on shockwave therapy. Uh, it's a pretty sleek device that has uh, uh, lithotripsy emitters inside of the balloons that uh, contains then saline and contrast, our usual mix. Uh, lithotripsy energy being delivered, creating small bubble and leading to acoustic pressure wave that then travels through the soft tissue freely, but when it hits a calcium, causing the breakage of the calcium. When then you look into the vessel, how it looks like, on the left panel, you have the severely calcified concentric lesion with thick calcium, and after the lithotripsy, you see multiple fractures as demonstrated by arrows. Uh, currently, uh, it's available only um, on Health Canada's special access uh, program, and patient has to be informed about using it before. We didn't have many trials. <coughs> uh, currently, the best trial we have is Disrupt Coronary Artery Disease 3 trial that was just recently published at TCT a few days ago, which was designed as a single arm multi center US regulatory approved design study, essentially trying to demonstrate to US regulators or other regulators that it's a safe procedure. As you can see, it's compared to historical uh, background uh, with rotational atherectomy. Uh, roughly the same uh, safety profile with about 7% risk of the procedure, which is driven by periprocedural AMI. Interestingly, uh, they were able to cross the calcified lesion in 96% of the time and achieve clinical and angiographical success in 92%, which is interesting because the device is very bulky and we have significant difficulties crossing heavily calcified lesion. That said, the severity and complexity of the lesion that we're using IVL on might be different than was included in a trial. This is example of the IVL. Uh, you can see patient, this is case of 71 years old, uh, diabetic uh, smoker with high blood pressure and dyslipidemia, so typical non-STEMI uh, patient that presented and had a culprit lesion in a circumflex which does not seem significantly calcified on the angiogram. Then uh, we tried to, we crossed the lesion, predilated with the balloon, and you see certain under expansion there, which was not fully recognized and stand was deployed. And this is uh, results after the stand, i.e. stand regret with significant residual stenosis distally, which is unacceptable uh, result and likely leading to uh, stent thrombosis and occlusion. Therefore, we proceeded with uh, IVL. Uh, <clears throat> we exchanged the guides for different support, advanced the uh, uh, guideliner, significantly increased the uh, support, and we're able to deliver this bulky uh, balloon into the vessel. This just putting balloon here took us about half an hour. Once we able to deliver it, we inflated the balloon and you clearly see on the expansion of the balloon. After delivering the therapies, the calcium cracked and balloon nicely expanded. And we got final result with no residual stenosis and good under uh, uh, ex expansion of the stent. So we have two techniques, how we're using that. There are multiple unofficial uh, suggestions uh, how to use it. This particular one is from Italian ones. Uh, so if you have mal cal calcifications, you proceed with regular angioplasty. If balloon doesn't expand properly, then you proceed with lithotripsy. If you're trying to cross with a balloon and you can't, and so it's simply going through rotational atherectomy, and after which, if you can't expand the balloon, you go to lithotripsy. And then if you can cross with the balloon or, or imaging, which is strongly recommended, you assess the calcium score either by IVAS or OCT and then based on the severity if it's very severe you proceed with lithotripsy if you can cross with the balloon or rotational atherectomy if it's not severely calcified you go to high balloon pressure and inflation and again assess the result if it's suboptimal after non-compliant balloon then you proceed to lithotripsy strongly advised as on the bottom after the stand before the stand use the intracoronary imaging to guide the therapy so in a summary, calcium is relatively frequent, about 20%. It's not the new kid on the block. 
represent technical challenges from revascularization, especially as the severity increases. Uh, from interventional perspective, intracoronary imaging is very important for PCI planning and optimization of the results and to minimize the risk of the procedure. Uh, algorithm, as I shown you, is very easy. Uh, procedure by itself is far from it uh, on uh, multiple occasions. So it's more considered as a part of the CHIP complex high risk uh, indicated patient. It's not cheap neither. Regular balloons are about $160. Rotational atherectomy burr is $2,500 and IVL is $3,500. So significant expense, uh, not to mention that it incre significantly increases risk of procedure for both IVL and rotational atherectomy in a range of five to 7% compared to less than 1% of his balloon angioplasty. Again, if you cross the point of no return of this very aggressive balloon, then risks exponentially increases become significantly higher than using uh, calcium modifying therapy. Uh, what we're trying to do is avoid ad hoc complex calcified lesion intervention uh, and having ROTA and IVL as a bailed out strategy when nothing else working. Uh, especially because risk is increased, therefore it needs to be discussed with the patient. And if you properly plan it, you lower the risk of the procedure and increase the success. So sometimes it's better just to stop and have a proper discussion. And most importantly, uh, team approach is absolutely crucial, both on physician and especially nursing staff, because preparation of these techniques and the skill on the nursing side is ex extremely important. Uh, achieve the best result with minimal risk to the patient. Thank you. Yara, that was fantastic. I'm just going to stop your share screen and then um, sh share my video. All right. Um, well, thank you so much. That was excellent. Um, first question for you is, you talked about about a 1.6% use for uh, rotational atherectomy, and obviously shockwave is a, is a special access, so it's difficult to kind of gauge its use. But what percentage of times do you think you know? Like, I mean, we've we've talked about overall utilization, but what percentage of the time do you think that we should probably be using these uh, these sort of technologies in our patient population in the cath lab? I think we currently are at the level that we probably should be using using it. Uh, looking at uh, uh, European data, which is UK using it 3%, Germany using it less than 1%. So somewhere around 1.5% is probably most appropriate. Uh, being due diligent and using it an appropriate patient is probably the most important one. So really elective use rather than routine use would be advised. Uh, second question uh, is, you talked about obviously planning these procedures. It's better than trying to do them ad hoc. Um, do you ever, I mean, obviously there's not only just the technical aspects of doing these, there's the risk of distal embolization. Do you ever consider, do you ever consider in these patients like who might be at risk for coronary dissection, possibly needing surgical backup? Like do you, do you get to that stage or do you feel fairly confident that you know, in all likelihood, it's not an, it's not necessarily an expected outcome and that you can get away without having surgical backup in these patients. So probability of the uh, perforations are relatively low, especially if you're using it properly and you're using the imaging because you know what your uh, comfort level is, how big the vessel is, therefore you don't go over, over the limit. That said, majority of these patients are part of the CHIP program, complex high-risk interventional patients or indicated patients, when we often have a discussion with the surgeon. And many of these patients that come and be using these devices are usually previously seen by the surgeon and the non-surgical candidates because of other comorbidities. Uh, and then we usually involve the surgeon with the procedure, whether it's the LV support, whether it's having the backup, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So it's multi-team uh, discussions and decisions to, to get these patients through as uh, safely as possible. If these complex patients have a surgical option, uh, often that would be the better option. But sometimes the surgical risk is prohibitive. Therefore, 
be pushing the envelope to help them as much as we can, despite all the risk that the procedure carries. So, I mean, when you talk about outcomes, uh, I mean, obviously a lot of the outcomes that are reported in the trials are more clinical outcomes, but, you know, from a sort of a personal experience standpoint, you know, what's the, what's the risk of distal embolization in these patients? Do you worry about it? Is it fairly at a microvascular level that you're, you're seeing it and as a result it has minimal consequence or is there a greater risk than that? Um, based on the trials, the risk is higher. We have not seen the higher incident of so-called no reflow, which is reflection of the distal embolization. Actually, from the perspective from before having Garota and IVL in St. John, we actually saw higher risk of complication, especially vessel perforation and tamponade without using these techniques because we were pushing the envelope uh, way too far with the balloons and pressures that, that we were using and the vessel ruptured because the balloon was very uncontrolled. Compared to now, we're trying to modify in a very controlled, safe matter and we have very little complications. So far, we had one major complication which was stuck burr and it was stuck so badly in a coronary that even Chris could not pull it out of the OR, which is all in OR. It's a very fear of compli complications when you can't pull something out of the coronary. Mm. Uh, but luckily it only happened one time. At and, and the patient's left with a diamond bullet, which is, you know, once again, a positive, I guess. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's, uh, he, he's more valuable now. Yeah, exactly. Um, last, uh, second to last question. Um, some of the trial data that you'd showed uh, with rotational atherectomy, uh, a lot of the results were not significant. I mean, they trended towards something, but they were not significant. I mean, your thoughts on that? I mean, do you feel to some extent that's just underpowered studies or, you know, or are we likely going to see some of those differences as these trials become larger and larger? So it was really good that there were no significant differences. The reason being, in the old days, as I said, traditional use of rotational atherectomy originally, those complications were, rates were in like 20, 30 percent. Those patients were dying in all day or had massive infarcts and vessel was not recovered. Mm. So getting back to if you can open it with a balloon, it's a relatively safe procedure. If you can't open it with a balloon, then you move to more aggressive therapy. And despite that you're using more aggressive therapy that carries high risk, you still have roughly the same uh, risk, which in this particular case, not being significantly different, is really beneficial. As I said, you can spin the results one way or other. Uh, major component is that if we would not use rotational atherectomy, 20% of patients would be left with untreated vessel. Right, exactly. Last question. Um, so from a surgical standpoint, oh, calcified targets are a challenge in the OR in terms of being able to open the vessel, in terms of being able to graft to the vessel, you know, in a hemostatic fashion, get good flows, all of the above, much of the same things that you deal with. And our a coronary assessment is typically relegated to, you know, the limitations of whatever it is that the cath presents. So if you get a good image, you can kind of see maybe calcium, uh, as you showed, but that's, we don't have any more information beyond that. Now you showed OCT as a, as a, as a optical coherence tomography, as an, as an, ex, as an example of how you can gauge calcium, uh, in the, in the vessel. Is there something you would suggest from our standpoint? Obviously, you can't OCT everyone. There's a cost to that. But is there a value potentially to CTing these patients, doing a proper coronary CT if we're worried about calcium buildup? I mean, we do it for aortic calcification to see if whether or not they're a surgical candidate. Is that something that would be reasonable potentially for, uh, for coronary calcification? Probably, as you suggested, the CT would be the best option. But it really depends on how often do you come to the problem with the calcium in a uh, OR? Sometimes you can tell that the vessel is calcified all the way to the apex, to the distal end where you can't bypass anything. Majority of these times, uh, calcification that we encounter is happening in the proximal vessels and slowly uh, is less and less calcified more distally. If you have concerns about the, C, about the amount of the calcium uh, and where you're going to put your tar uh, target for your graft, and you worry that it might be too calcified, 
maybe then doing a CT and trying to assess it might be worthwhile. And yep. interventional radiologists doing the TAVI CTs, they can really nicely delineate the amount of the calcium for you. I think as JF said, I mean, I, I feel the same way too. I typically underestimate the degree of calcification. So it may be worthwhile looking at this a little more scientifically. Uh, Yaro, thank you so much. That was an excellent talk and a textbook uh, length of talk and great Q&A. Um, reminder for next week, uh, we have Dr. Sharif Kamel uh, from Moncton City who's gonna speak to us about uh, endocarditis management uh, you know, in the periphery. Uh, and just, I think that would be a great review of that particular subject, especially given the fact that we're seeing so much more of it. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Have a good one.